On today's show, evaluating phase one of the Houston Rockets rebuild. Areas of a lot of success and some areas where they maybe struggled a little bit. How do we evaluate the job that General Manager Rafael Stone and the rest of the front office have done? Is Stone proven at this point or is he still unproven as a general manager? It's all coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. Alperon Shengun and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Hey, Houston fans, I am so happy. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian, a credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And as always, thank you so much for making LOR part of your day every single day, whether it's on the way to work, on your lunch break in the gym. Thank you for being an LOR part of your day every single day. Joining us now is none other than the pod father himself, Rockets Wire editor and host of the Logger Line podcast, Ben DuBose. You can track down on Twitter at Ben DuBose. And Ben, we are now fully into what is now the dog days of the NBA offseason. Summer League is over, which also effectively means that Right now, as things stand, barring any weird last-minute changes, whatever, off-season moves, this Rockets roster that we are looking at and all the moves that have been made up to this point, this is basically the end, the culmination of Phase 1 of the Rockets rebuild. We've talked about these phases before ad nauseum yep. in press conferences with Rafael Stone, with the with Ime Udoka now coming in as the new head coach and kind of what it means for the organization moving forward. So now I feel like it's a very good time to kind of reflect on the entirety of phase one. We're not going to be able to get to everything that transpired in phase one. It would take a long time to get through the last three years of middling performances and all the ups and downs that we've dealt with throughout this first chunk of the rebuild. But it is. It does feel like a good time to maybe reflect a little bit and try to, you know, see what we can evaluate from what went right in phase one, what mm. went wrong, what we're still looking for, some of the big questions that are looming over this organization as we look to hopefully see them adjust and move from phase one into phase two. So let's start with this. What to you is the biggest takeaway from phase one in your eyes right now? And then I'll share mine after you go. For me, it's talent over development. They clearly made a choice. I would say certainly this past season and maybe at some point two seasons ago to continue with the status quo, letting Steve, Steven Silas play out his contract because the juice wasn't worth the squeeze with regards to making a change at the head coach position. Clearly, there were problems in terms of the day-to-day -day culture, the development, some of the individuals were getting better, but quite frankly, and we've discussed this before, it would be alarming if they weren't, if there was no individual project uh, progress. Collectively, there wasn't a lot of growth. It wasn't a situation like you see in Oklahoma City or Utah where the sum of the parts was better than the individual talents. In fact, it was the reverse. And yet the Rockets stayed the course in large part because it was convenient. It Well, first off, let's be honest, it maximized their draft capital. We knew that Steven Silas, you know, we've jokingly called him the tank commander on Twitter, but there's some truth in that. Look, he did maximize whoa, 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 the draft ben, the, the, the absolute disrespect to the tank commander, John Wall, and the oh. assistant to the tank commander, Avery Bradley, okay? Show them Fair. some respect, Ben. Fair. But I think, you know, the Rockets made a conscious decision to just let this play out. I think in large part because of the draft capital, you know, they knew that even if in the short term these things were negatives, that at the end of the day, they would be maximizing their odds at a top four pick, which they ended up getting in each of the three Steven Silas seasons. And you also had 
a similar situation with Kevin Porter Jr. at point guard, which I understand not wanting to give a 31-year-old John Wall the keys, especially if he's trying to rebuild his value. That wasn't a good fit. But I think there were also signs along the way that Kevin Porter Jr. wasn't going to be the guy. And yet they clearly didn't think it was worth it to pursue more of a veteran stopgap. It was just sort of let's let this play out and then make the big pivot after the third year. And I guess you can also say, look, um, they weren't going to be in a great position to hire a head coach a year ago. So now that you wait until 2023 and you have all this cap space and you have one more high draft pick coming in, then potentially you're more attractive to a guy like Ime Udoka. And they swung big for a head coach and they got him. Credit to Rafael Stone, credit to Solomon Fertitta. They did get that done. I think that's great for the franchise. However, the process to get to this point, they took a lot of blows on the chin in terms of the reputation of the franchise, the day-to-day culture, the development or lack thereof. All those issues are very real. What the Rockets basically determined, and I believe the quote that Patrick Fertitta has given before is pain tolerance. They have a higher pain tolerance than a lot of other franchises. I think that's part of it. But I think the other part of it that goes hand in hand with it is they really don't think that any of this stuff from the last couple of years is going to be a big deal in the grand scheme in terms of how it affects Jalen Green and Jabari Smith Jr. and Alper and Shingun's development, the players that they turn into and the chemistry of the group. Now that you have this full nucleus together and you've got some new parts, then they basically can start from scratch. To me, what stands out from, I suppose, the phase one, as you called it, is the Rockets just believing that at the end of the day, nothing matters but maximizing talent and that with the right coach, you can hit the reset button and none of these issues from the last couple of years are going to be all that meaningful in the grand scheme. I hope they're right, but it is a question because you know some of this nucleus, we talked about the core six. I know you had the recent episode on that. Look, four of your core six were here the last two years and two of them for multiple seasons. Is that going to be a factor in their long-term career trajectory? I hope it's not. I trust Ime Udoka. I like the culture guys they brought in this offseason. But until they do it, it is going to be a valid question. Speaking of uh, pain tolerance. It is very painful for all of us going through this process. It was very painful for all of us going through this process. Piggybacking a little bit off of what you said, Ben. I think in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the macro viewpoint, right? Like they were ne- they were always transparent and R- Rafael was th- like this way from day one about, hey, you know, he didn't go out there and say, we're going to tank. We're going to be awful. But he was like, we're going to be young and we're going to we're going to run fast and we're going to jump high and we're going to have a lot of dunks. Yeah. And like he was always, you know, kind of, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Hey, we're going to be bad. Right. They didn't yeah. hide that. They really didn't sugarcoat it. We knew what the what the situation was. So I'd say by and large, like 80 percent of what they set out to do, the macro side of things, if you're looking at it through that lens, 80 percent of it. Fantastic. They killed it. They they acquired all this top end talent. And you've got to feel really, really good about all that. And then it's that other 20%, the day-to-day that we had to live through for the better part of these last three years. And when you're in it, when you're in the day-to-day, it feels awful. Going game to game, practice to practice every single day. Shingun's getting benched. Why is Kevin still the point guard? Why haven't they fired Silas? All of that. It feels horrendous. But now that we've made it out and we're, you know, we're on the other side finally and we're able to look back. I, I firmly believe that we're not going to be worried about the day-to-day that we went through for these last three years as soon as we get the breath of fresh air that is going to be the beginning of mm-hmm. phase two in this rebuild. Yeah, I think and hope so. A, a more concise way to illustrate the point that I was trying to get to, look at Houston this past season and look at Oklahoma City the past season. Oklahoma City got the coach that they believed in. They let him do his thing. They built the culture a year earlier. And the records this past season reflected that. The Rockets clearly don't think that Oklahoma City being one year ahead of schedule is all is going to be all that meaningful in the grand scheme in terms of the trajectory of these two rebuilds. I think internally, the Rockets view themselves still on a fairly similar timeline, perhaps more expedited than Oklahoma City, even though the Thunder were much better last season, simply because the Thunder are doing much more of a draft emphasis. With Houston, it's clearly much more a combination. Yeah, they have these draft picks, but moving forward, it's also about win-now pieces. It's not like the Rockets have the overwhelming draft capital, and Houston is more of a free agency draw. But the point is that the Thunder clearly put a big priority on culture and what the cohesiveness in that locker room could do, not just in terms of wins and losses, but for the development of these young pieces. And we saw Jalen Williams 
become a legitimate rookie of the year candidate as one example. I think the Rockets are saying, you know what, even though we took it on the chin collectively, at the end of the day, the discrepancy this past year isn't going to matter all that much in the grand scheme. Once you have the right coach, once you have the guys, the right guys, the veteran supporting cast around them, then you can make this thing sort of skip a few steps, if you will, and climb up that ladder a lot more quickly. I think it will work. I'm with you. I'm fairly optimistic. But until they do it, it's absolutely a fair question. And to me, it's one that's going to define the the first three years of the Rockville Stone administration. Yeah, absolutely. And we can also, you can also look back at some other past examples of guys like Ben Simmons, Joel and B, uh, maybe Ben Simmons is a terrible example here before he just mentally collapsed. But before all that happened, right, Ben Simmons, Joel and B, Devin Booker, another example, uh, guys who went through kind of, a, you know, a really, really horrendous rebuilding period where their teams were just really bad and still came out on the other end perfectly fine. So, Coming up, want to continue navigating this kind of evaluation of phase one of the Rockets rebuild areas of areas of success, areas that they kind of struggled in, as well as talking a little bit about Rafael Stone. Is he proven or still unproven at this point as the general manager of the Houston Rockets? We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets, up to $200. That's right, just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 that you can spend betting everything from the money line to over-unders to who you think is going to hit the first home run, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number Number one sports book. So sign up today and visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's fanduel.com slash locked on. Fanduel, official partner of Major League Baseball. And continuing on here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, then when we go back and try to identify some of the defining moments of what was phase one for the Rockets. Obviously, talent accumulation was a big one, right? They walked away yeah. with top picks in each of the last three drafts, second, then third, then fourth, translating to Jalen Green, Jabari Smith Jr., and most recently, Amin Thompson. And then they also walked away with some mid-tier draft picks that are still part of now the consensus core six guys in Alperin Shingun, Tari Eason, and now Cam Whitmore. So the talent acquisition part was huge. I think... Though, for me, coming out of phase one, the biggest piece that they added this offseason, right? Coming into this offseason, knowing that they had the cap space to spend, which they ultimately dropped on Fred Van Vliet, Dylan Brooks, Jock Landale, Jeff Green, having to pivot after the Brook Lopez situation didn't pan out. I think Ime Odoka is going to be so important for everybody on this roster. Yeah. And I felt like that message was pretty clear from me potentially yourself and other kind of, you know, media covering the team is going into this off season, whoever they got to be the next head coach was going to really be kind of the defining element of where this team moves going forward. And when we looked at the potential candidates that were on that list, when you saw the Nick nurses, the Kenny Atkinson's, the Frank Vogels, and obviously Ime Odoka yep. to me, Ime just had all the skills, all the, cachet, whatever you want to call it. He was the right guy for the job in my mind. And I think we're already starting to kind of see the benefits of what he's bringing to this, to the organization and how he's going to steer these young guys into the next chapter of this rebuilding process. Yeah, absolutely. And one area that I think Rafael deserves more credit than he gets is his willingness and ability to make the sale to the right people. Obviously, Ime is most important. You can also point to recently keeping John Lucas in the organization, even though Lucas isn't going to be on the staff of Ime. Apparently, Ime wants to go a lot younger with his assistants. Keeping Lucas in the organization, it's a big culture move. And so for all the talk we've heard about the Rockets and culture the last couple of years, finding a way to keep John Lucas around could be pivotal for some of these young guys that have been a key part of your rebuild thus far. And of course, you want to take the next steps in their development. And I think, you know, 
Ime Udoka had options. Let's be real. Certainly Toronto was referenced as a possibility in this cycle, but he didn't have to take any job. He could have waited on the sidelines for the next job to open up at midseason the way Quinn Snyder did last year. Rafael had to give Ime Udoka a certain amount of autonomy and ability to make his own decisions, have some input on the roster, and above all else, he had to make Ime comfortable in the, in the dynamic between the two of them. There has to be a good relationship. Sure, Tillman Fertitta being willing to open up the checkbook and pay a top 10 salary, which he did, that's part of it. But the other part, too, is making Ime comfortable that this is the right fit for him. And we asked Ime about it at the opening press conference, and he talked about how this is an organization that doesn't want to be just a five or a six seed. They actually want to compete for championships consistently, and that means not skipping any steps. That means not going on the upper-class mediocrity treadmill, but being willing to do the things the Rockets have done the last couple of years to bottom out that talent acquisition that – you talked about. And of course, that's phase one. Now in phase two, there's a different criteria. There's different benchmarks. But the bottom line is it comes down to that pain tolerance we referenced earlier, the Rockets being willing to do some hard things to have the greater long-term payoff, to maximize upside, to have your ability to actually win a championship one day and hopefully multiple championships. So I agree with you that that Ime is important for them because clearly, you know, moving forward, you, you hope that the core six pan out and you hope that he can draw upon his experiences developing Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum in Boston and so on and so forth. But we also know this Rockets team, and this goes back throughout the franchise's history, they want to be attractive on the free agency and trade markets. And these days, it's all about leverage trades. We just saw in 2023, look, free agency is somewhat limited. At the end of the day, it, it, a lot of it comes down to the NBA being attractive to the next superstar when 18 months before his contract is going to expire, he decides to declare a, a crazy situation. And hopefully Houston's at the front of that list. And Ime has a clear rapport with NBA players. That's something that's been very well documented across the league from his time in Boston and in the months since his hire by the Rockets. And so I think he checks the most boxes from a culture standpoint, from being attractive and making Houston desirable to other players, especially really good players around the league. And uh, above all else, I just think that we can point to mistakes that Raphael Stone has made. And certainly there are plenty, but I think the case for autism for Raphael, certainly these core six, I think, if even two or three of those guys end up panning out at a level of being the best or second best player on a contending team, then you're cooking with gas. And those are far more important than some of these little things that, you know, we can fairly criticize. Did the Rockets, you know, you can get into the whole asset management debate from this off season. I think the draft is part of it, but also the executive level hires Ime Udoka, keeping John Lucas around, getting ownership, in this case, Tillman Fertitta and Patrick as the liaison, to buy in on this plan to bottom out the last three years because it was not great for business, let's be honest. And yet the Rockets were able to make the sale to ownership that this is the way, that even if you have to take some short-term pain, this is where the long-term payoff is. And so that's yeah, something they, they that- Yeah, they could have broken glass at any point, right? We, we yes. talk about the pain tolerance throughout this whole process. At any point during the- 12 game, 15 game, 20 game losing streak. The Rockets ownership could have been like, no, this feels awful. We're getting flamed. We're the laughing stock of the NBA. We got to panic. We got to pivot. We got to right the ship. We got to try and get stack up some win somehow, somewhere. And no, they stayed the course. Yeah. And that was very important. And, and, I, and I do think that's something that Rafael deserves more credit for than he gets. Say what you will about him in terms of the track record. It's not all great. It's not all bad. But he does seem to have a strong ability when it comes to having the hard conversations and getting people to buy in, in terms of getting the Fertitas to buy in on this approach, in terms of getting Ime Udoka to buy in on the Rockets being the best fit for him this offseason, in terms of even players and coaches that have left the organization, perhaps John Wall notwithstanding, um, you know, Rafael does seem to have a strong relationship. I think the relationship that, that Rafael built... Terrible. I think the relationship. I don't even that, think I'm supposed to. I don't even think I'm allowed to play that on the podcast. Oh wow! Oh well, it's, but it's I, I staying. Think, yeah, but I think the more important I mean, takeaway from the John. Hang on, trash. There we go. That's better. I think the more important takeaway from the the way the John Wall situation unravel is that Rafael clearly kept himself on good terms with Rich Paul, his agent, throughout that process. We heard at one point. Rich Paul actually in the 2021 to 22 season actually praising Rafael for how they handled the John situation 
in contrast to the way that Gerald Morey was handling the thing with Ben Simmons in Philly. And that ultimately ended up paying off to some degree because who's the agent for Fred Van Fleet, who was the Rockets headline signing this offseason? Rich Paul. So on some level, yeah, it absolutely did pay off. And I think getting that team option, perhaps building that relationship paid off a little bit. Who's to say? I think ultimately, Rafael does deserve some credit for getting people to buy in. And, you know, I mentioned the relationship with Rich Paul, even through the topsy-turvy way that John Wall slowly exited the organization. Look at what Stephen Silas has you know, said. You know why, he, you know why he exited the organization in such a topsy-turvy way? It's because he took the same ramp down away from the organization uh, that he was taking while he was ramping up. It's the it's yeah. the ramp that leads to nowhere. That's why. Yeah. But look, I mean... You, it, I think it's also noteworthy that the last couple of years, it you haven't, or the last couple of months, excuse me, you haven't seen Stephen Silas airing all the dirty laundry. They found a way even to let Stephen go fairly amicably. I, I, and I will that say, goes into why they didn't. On, on that Stephen Silas note, I do think it has some a little bit of something to do with, right? Had they canned him midseason, right, I do yeah, think we might have seen some of the, right? Like, yeah. you know, don't, don't, what are you with the wind horse? What's, what's going on in Houston with the double, yeah. the double pointer fingers yeah. up? But legitimately, right, is the fact that they held on to him. I, I, this isn't source. This isn't, this is just a, a speculation, but I feel like part of the agreement there was something along the lines of Steven basically saying, Hey, I know you guys want to move on from me. Clearly this is going to come to an end at the end of the season. Let me coach out the remainder of this contract. Let me just finish the year. Don't fire me. Right. And then we'll just keep, you know, we can just end don't things. pick up my option. Ex exactly. Right. Like, and I think that was probably an agreement that they came to, which is just like, Hey, clearly we're going to part ways, but let's just do it in the most amicable way possible. That way, no, there's no bad blood on either side. And I think that's ultimately what played into some of their decision to just hold on to him through the, you know, through the duration of his contract. Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, it's easy to joke, as we did in the first segment, about, you know, tank commander stuff, and that may have played some role. But I think there's also a relationship part of it as well. And the Rockets simply don't think that the short-term damage from some of the things that happened the last two years is going to be all that meaningful in the grand scheme if they get the the right guy in place next, which we hope they've done with Ime Udoka, Ben Sullivan, and this new staff that he's brought in since last season. But look, I just think that's something that, Again, it's not easy to have everyone in alignment, but one thing that Rafael seems to have done, at least in regards to the coaches and the executives, there does seem to be a shared vision. People are on the same page, and that doesn't guarantee success. At the end of the day, if Evan Mobley turns out to be way better than Jalen Green, then that's a failure for Rafael Stone, and that's going to define his tenure, should that turn out to be the case. And all these good vibes between getting ownership on board and getting who we think is the right coach in Ime Udoka, at the end of the day, that's small potatoes. If it turns out that, you know, again, Mobley is better than Jalen, Jabari is a boss, maybe they should have taken someone other than Amon Thompson. I'm not saying I believe any of those things. I'm just saying that ultimately those are the types of things that are going to ultimately determine the success or failure of Rafael Stone in all likelihood. But I do think at least based on what we know now through three years, the way he's managed relationships, at least the key relationships at an organizational level, has been fairly good. And I think that's something that organizationally they deserve a bit more credit for than perhaps they've gotten. Coming up, one other major domino that took place this offseason that the Rockets maybe avoided a bullet that they potentially dodged and who should ultimately get the credit for that as well as, just again, is, is Stone proven or unproven at this point? We're going to get there in just one moment. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Ben, one area that was the talk of the town, if you will, going into this offseason for the Rockets was the potential return of one James Harden. And ultimately that situation didn't work itself out. And now for a variety of different reasons, we see James Harden getting ready to do his uh, little Exodus <laughs> dance from Philadelphia, one that we are all situation is crazy. Part three. Yeah. Situation is crazy. Part three. Um, it's like just, an annual thing at this point. Yeah, really. It's just like every, it's like every year. Oh man, it's, it's, it's James Harden o'clock. Here he comes uh, trying to force his way out of another organization. It's become a recurring pattern to where clearly there's something going on with James, right? If you can't win with Kyrie and KD, if you can't win with Joel and B, the reigning MVP, honestly, like there's. Honestly, I think it's a little simpler than that. I honestly think that from almost the moment he left in January, 2021, he had been building in his mind the roadmap back to Houston in July of 2023. Mm -hmm. I think, quite frankly, he was caught off board by the Rockets and Ime Udoka in particular. I think he was a big 
driver in the decision to ultimately go with Fred Van Vliet in that lead guard role instead, someone that's a bit more versatile in terms of the ways you can use him and perhaps play him a bit more off ball if it turns out that Amon Thompson is ready for lead responsibilities sooner rather than later. I honestly think that James never wanted to leave Houston. There's reasons beyond basketball for that. I think he's always been and especially the last year when it's gotten within, you know, whenever it gets within 12 months, all of a sudden it starts to feel real. I think his focus has been on getting to free agency, getting back to Houston. I think he just thought that based on his success from 2012 through 2020, that Houston's interest would be a foregone conclusion. And now that it wasn't, I think quite frankly, he's a little bit lost. Yeah, no. And, and, you know, he's, seems very rudderless at this point, like what he's going to do next, yeah. whether he actually manages to force his way out of Philadelphia. He's got, he's already, you know, establishing the playbook, the cryptic Instagram posts and all of this. Look, he's going to we, China. We know. Oh God. Where's the, uh, that that's deserving of a, he's going to China. <laughs> um, look I, from what we understand, right. Is it feels like there was very much an internal push from Ime Odoka to go with Fred Van Vliet as the number one target when we know that there was interest on both sides, both from James Harden and from the Rockets organizationally to want to bring James Harden back, which, you know, kind of paints the picture that Rafael Stone was probably behind, you know, most of the push to want to bring James Harden back. And that just didn't really mesh with the vision that Ime Odoka has for the team going forward and what he envisions here, what he wants to accomplish with the Rockets. And I do think there is something to be said for the time that Udoka did spend with James Harden in Brooklyn, right? A guy who yeah. was as close to James as anybody ever could be, you know, on a coaching staff, working with him day to day when he was with the Nets. He got, he was firsthand, got a look at all the turbulence and the way that that situation melted down catastrophically. And maybe he saw that firsthand and was like, you know what? That's not the kind of guy that I want to bring back to Houston. So I want to give Ime credit for that, right? And for steering the Rockets away from that decision, because I do think that there's very clearly an expectation from ownership that the team takes a step forward next year. I don't think yeah. there's going to be like a firm, like win mandate in place. I don't think they have like some arbitrary, like, okay, Ime, you have yeah, to win yeah, yeah. 35 games or something, but they want to see the team be significantly better than where they were at, right? Because of some of the reasons you pointed out before, right? Is this team was at a place where ta the talent did not match the production on the court whatsoever because of a mismanagement of players, whatever you want to call it with the previous coaching staff, all of that. So you factor in just getting them to a level where they should be performing at because of the talent, as well as the additional step of the internal growth, as well as adding the veteran pieces, all of that mixed together should hopefully give you a team that is at least competing for what the play in, hopefully as yeah. far as goals yeah. and ambitions for this next season. But I, I present that whole argument to say how much different would he feel about this off season, right? Had Rafael stone maybe gotten his way and gone with the more guaranteed path forward of a James Harden, right? I know that that didn't happen. The Rockets ultimately drew their line in the sand. Now, whether that line in the sand was drawn exclusively by Ime Odoka saying, I don't want James Harden, whether that was Rafael Stone and company saying, hey, we're open to you coming back, James, but only at this number. And they yeah. drew the line in the sand that way. I do think there is some gray area there to maybe be looking at like, what was the, what were the goals of this organization going into this off season? The, yeah. The way I think it all ties together. I think in a lot of respects, it's a vote of confidence for the young guys they have in place. Mm. Because in a vacuum, James Harden is a better basketball player than Fred Van Fleet. Yeah. I'm sorry, he just is. Whoa, However, whoa, spicy hot take, Ben. No. I know. The question is how it fits with these young guys that you're trying to develop. And if you are gravely concerned about the young guys you have in place and whether they're going to pan out at an all-star or even just a very good player on a contending team level, then the short-term stimulus of James Harden, the immediate relevancy that comes from that, in my opinion, would clearly be the way to go. The case for Fred Van Vliet is if you do believe in guys like Jalen Green, like Amon Thompson, like potentially even Kevin Porter Jr., to take on some of the playmaking responsibility and thus, because the reps are going to them and not this lead guard, then you want your lead guard, in this case, Fred, to be able to do more things off ball, to be more willing to do things off ball, to provide value defensively. And that's something that we've seen in the past, even as a huge James supporter. Look, he does pout when he's off ball and 
the offense isn't running through him. Defensively, I don't know if it's so much pouting. It's just that at this point in his NBA career, he can't really defend anywhere except in the post. But how is he going to de- defend in the post in Houston when you have Alper and Shingun? Because it's not like you're really going to switch Alper and Shingun onto guards all that often. So it, the bottom line is, it, as I see it, it's a vote of confidence that I think these young guys can eventually take that leap. Maybe it's not this season. Maybe it's two, three years down the line. But it's basically the Rockets saying, look, I don't think we need this short-term stimulus. Even if Fred isn't as good as James day one, we think that long-term it's going to be worth it because it's going to be easier to transition guys in this core six like Jalen, like Amon, like Cam Whitmore into more on-ball creation reps. And that's where Fred is potentially a bigger fit. And... But a is better it, fit. But is it a but and this is where I this is where I struggle a little bit, right? Is it a vote of confidence from Ime, from Rafael? From, because because you look at well, like, it's like who and so 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 if it's from Ime, right? And that's where I get into a little bit of maybe some of the concern because I do think that bringing James Harden back, like you said, right, would have been the immediate injection of like, okay, you have a certain floor, you have a certain guarantee. I think that bringing James Harden back would have been potentially the best thing for the safety and security in the immediate future of Rafael Stone's job, right? Because right now we're yeah. at, we're at a phase now where the next head that will roll in this organization is Rafael Stone. If things don't pan out, right? If things look bad a year oh, yeah. from now, Agreed. if things like, like Ime is safe for a while. Ime is safe for probably at least two years to kind of try to get his vision on the floor and what he's trying to, you know, instill and build and, and everything that he wants to accomplish. So I do have that little bit of like maybe concern where was Rafael looking to bring James back because he knew that that would give him some safety in his job security, like some job security moving forward, or was he looking out for the best interest of the team? And thankfully, Ime did what I think we collectively agree is in the best interest of the team and the young guys moving forward. And had they not gone with Ime, had they gone with Frank Vogel or a different head coaching candidate, maybe we're talking about a James Harden return right now because maybe that would have been what would have been best for stone moving forward that's all i'm saying i'm playing devil's advocate here possibly for just a moment. It, it, it's possible the one thing that i will say as far as the members of the front office that were and are still in houston i was told consistently throughout last season whenever i would ask about free agency whenever i would ask about how certain guys would be used in the future when we talk about is kevin porter jr the point guard if he's not who is it the default answer to all of those was we first got to figure out who the coach is in terms of number one, are you keeping Steven Silas? And if you are not, then sorry, I'm having a bit of a Mike Pence moment here with some gnat flying around my head to those watching on a, uh, on video. But I think ultimately the Rockets wanted to figure out the coaching situation first. Are you bringing back Steven Silas? Cause it was the inflection point in his contract. And if not, who were you bringing in to replace him? And I think the reason they answered in that way was they were always going to give the coach the autonomy to then implement his vision and to have some say in the process. And I think the tidal wave of rumors connecting James to the Rockets, I think it's pretty clear now, even more so based on how lost James seems, how rudderless, as you put it, in the month since things have really broken down and it was obvious that James wasn't going to go to Houston James was the one that was desperate to come here. It was never the Rockets desperate to have him back. Now, I do think the Rockets were potentially open to it in some scenarios, but I think it was more the Rockets saying, yeah, we're potentially open to this. And James Harden and his camp knowing 100% this is what we want to do. And it's not like the Rockets are going to correct him because it's not like it's wrong. It's not like there's no scenarios where they would be interested. But I think for the Rockets, it was always a bit more of, Let's wait and see. We first got to decide who the coach is going to be. And, and to your, but to your to point play. about the coach, right? We kind of going through the coaching process. We looked at it and we're like, Frank Vogel's the Rafael pick, right? Like Frank Vogel is the guy that Rafael potentially wants to bring in as the head coach. A lot of the, you know, some of the information that we we both heard about, like so, you know, how the Rockets felt about certain candidates. It very much felt like Rafael was you know, very pro Vogel coming out of the interview process. And we know that while he may have still been high on Ime, there may have been certain reservations about it. We know that Ime got kind of like the uh, the Tillman approval after his his preliminary meeting in Houston. And Tillman was the guy that was like, that's my guy. Let's go get him. Let's sign off on him. Boom. And we're already seeing the ramifications of that where Ime has been able to throw his weight around a little bit with Rafael in and, regards to potentially bringing James Harden back. So you start to tie together the way, Rafael, all these threads and you're like, well. 
Rafael a, also mentioned that eBay was instrumental in the decision to play Jabari Smith at Summer League. Yeah, there was there was a, there, I, I just think there's a certain thread that you can follow a little bit here where because of bringing Ime and it, it kind of the Rockets had these two very clear paths that they could have gone this offseason and the Ime path led to a bunch of the decisions that we've seen kind of branch off like if you're looking at it as you know a tree with all the offshooting branches we've got like the Ime path and then we had what would have been I guess we could call the stone path had you hired Vogel and potentially brought back James Harden right and gone that route instead yeah well the one thing I will say Ime had options to go back to what we were saying a, a few minutes ago mm-hmm I don't think that Ime would choose to come here if he thought he would be butting heads with the GM. So regardless of what the GM's thought process might have been three months ago, the reality, I feel pretty confident in saying that Rafael had to sell Ime on the idea that he would be on board and not trying to fight him on the decisions that he makes and what direction he thinks is best for this organization I think Ime had to be convinced that Rafael was on board, that it wasn't just ownership basically going over Rafael's head and saying, this is our guy, deal with it. No, I think Ime had enough options that it's not worth it to him to take this job, if especially entering a pivotal offseason with $60 million in cap space, more than that, actually, you know that's basically a one-time thing. You can't really expect to have that again. So even if you want to say, well, Perhaps Ime was under the idea that it was a trial, an experiment with Rafael, and if it doesn't work out, you can just change the GM a year or two from now. Okay, well, at that point, many of your key decisions have already been made in regards to all the cap space this offseason, with regards to what we hope is their last high lottery pick for a while that became Amon Thompson. Rafael was the GM making those decisions, and Ime knew he would be when he made the decision to take this job in Houston. So I do think that ultimately, while you can say there was a stone path that might have gone somewhere else, ultimately, Rafael had to, I think, have Ime convinced that he was bought in on this vision as well. To me, the better way to put it is that I think clearly this is the Ime Yudoka vision for the Rockets, but Rafael had to show some semblance of humility during the interviewing process in order for this to be the outcome. I think Perhaps there's a world in which, you know, you hire Frank Vogel and he's a bit more, you know, under the thumb the way it felt at times Stephen Silas was the last couple of years. And we heard the anecdotal stories about Rafael being more involved in practices than perhaps he should be or than the average GM is and so on and so forth. I don't think that's going to happen under email. I think it, I think it's it might have honestly even been less so Frank Vogel under the thumb and more just, you know, again, I think so much of this has to do with email just having been. Uh, exposed to the James Harden experience already to where he was like, I don't want to do that part two, right? Whereas Frank Vogel wouldn't have had that same locker room experience having previously coached James Harden. He he would have a different set of experiences, right? Having coached LeBron and Anthony Davis and having been there with star players before, but never a James Harden. And so Frank Vogel would be able to jump back in the seat and being promised, hey, we're going to put you in charge. We're going to go get you James Harden. We're going to maybe trade a couple young guys and get James Harden a running mate. And we could have done the Band-Aid fix, right? The, The quick the quick trigger, hey, we're going to try and get back into relevancy overnight, doing it, you know, the the shortcut route, which is what a lot of us were really concerned about. And thankfully, it didn't go that way because of what they ultimately decided to go with Ime Odoka. And I do think, to, with, with your point, right, about, I do think there has to have been a level of organizational alignment across the board from ownership to front mm-hmm. office general manager with Rafael Stone to head coaching with Ime Odoka now in charge of things, uh, where those three guys all had to be, you know, in agreement about how they wanted to approach this offseason. And I do think that they, like organizationally, right, they factored Ime in a lot more to the decisions that were being made this offseason and the direction of yeah. the team than I think Steven Silas ever really got a chance to be involved. Yeah, because, 100%. Yeah. 100%. So. Now, and if you want to look at it, I guess, as glass half empty, you can say, well, maybe Rafael only got on board because he wants to survive and keep his job and – the alternative scenario where he has more of a heavy hand and then you don't bring in an Ime Udoka, then ultimately that makes it less likely for you to sign the types of players that you did this offseason and take the leap that we hope they're going to take next season. And then, as you mentioned earlier, clearly Rafael would be the next to go if this season or the next two seasons underwhelm. Then, yeah, perhaps there's some level of sort of self-preservation to it. 
that maybe it's not Rafael saying, yeah, I 100% think that this guy is better than me to sort of lead the direction of the organization. Maybe it's just that, you know, this is the best way for me to uh, survive because at this point, if something goes wrong, you know, it's on EMA and not me, blah, blah, blah. I guess you can argue that. But at the end of the day, what does it really matter? If you are a fan of the Rockets and you want and trust Ime Udoka and you believe in the direction, the culture he's trying to build, the players he's brought in, the systems that he's trying to install, if he has that autonomy and you trust him to do what he said he's trying to do, then ultimately, whether Rafael made the choosing truly of his own volition, the idea that, hey, I need to be a bit less hands-on than I was during the Steven Silas administration. I need to give Ime Udoka the keys to this organization. And even on matters of personnel in terms of, you know, should we make James Harden or Fred Van Vliet our top free agency priority? I think, you know, there's arguments that maybe Rafael had to come to Jesus moment and decided it himself. Maybe, you know, the Fertitas helped push him in that direction and there's a little bit of self-preservation to it. But at the end of the day, I just don't think it really matters how we got here. The point is that we are here and Ime Udoka, it's pretty clear in not just the initial press conference, but the actions that have been taken. You mentioned the Fred versus James. We can talk about Jabari at Summer League. We've seen examples time and time again, and even the coaching staff. Look, there's no one proven on staff. That's fairly unusual for a coach that as great as that year was, it's not as if Ime has been a head coach for a long time. And so typically the roadmap for you know, a coach of Ime's age and limited experience in the lead role is to have at least one big time assistant that perhaps has a lot of prior head coaching experience. Think the very Lionel similar Hollins. to Steven Silas and John Lucas. <laughs> yeah. Or Lionel Hollins too. That's where I was going with it. Um, there's none. I think he, Ime sold the Rockets on being able to bring in his guys that even if they're less proven, none have been head coaches before they're all younger. Ime clearly has a lot of say, and he was able to get them bought in that, hey, even if they don't have the proven track record, trust me, that speaks to the level of power that Ime has in this organization right now. It speaks to the level of control. Again, the bottom line is this is not Tillman Fertitta's Rockets. This is not Rafael Stone's Rockets. This is Ime Udoka's Rockets. I think that is the best way to put it. This is his organization. He is by far the most powerful person in the building at Toyota Center. And I don't think that was the case under Steven Silas. I do think it's the case now. And we can argue about exactly how we got here and how much of it was Rafael making this choice versus, you know, the Fertitas steering him in that direction or him wanting to sort of preserve his job. Yeah, there's fair arguments you can make. But at the end of the day, my answer to all of them is, what does it really matter? The point is right now, this is Ime Udoka's team. This is his vision. He's getting to do what he wants to do. And ultimately, if he's able to develop these core six and, you know, we've seen him bring in the Fred and Dylan types to be the veteran role players, Jeff Green as well. If that works out the way that Ime wants it to, then at the end of the day, that's going to be a success for Rafael Stone and Tillman Fertitta. And if it's not, then, you know, we can have a different conversation two or three years from now. But for now, yeah, it's Ime Udoka's it's his organization. And to me, that is the biggest decision of all. Bigger than Amon Thompson versus whoever else was in the mix at four. Bigger than whatever they did with their $65 million in cap space. The biggest decision that Rafael Stone and Tillman Fertitta, and we can quibble over the exact percentage of one versus the other. The biggest decision the Rockets as an organization made this offseason was to give everything to Ime Udoka. Make him the driver of this vehicle. And wherever they're going to go, for better or for worse, it's going to be Ime at the wheel. It's going to be him determining it in terms of uh, strategic decisions, in terms of day-to-day -day development, culture. He has a level of control that Steven Silas never got even close to over his three years. That was a conscious decision. And ultimately, even more than the draft picks, even more than free agency signings, ultimately that's going to determine the you know success or failure of this rebuild. And that's the perhaps the biggest choice of all that uh, Rafael and Tillman had to make this offseason. Forget Jesus at the wheel. We've got Ime at the wheel here with the Houston Rockets. Ben, you know the drill. Let everybody know where they can track you down at. 
Yep, uh, Ben Dubose on Twitter, the Rockets Wire on Twitter, the Logger Line on Twitter, RocketsWire.usatoday.com for all of your daily news coverage. And if you're on Twitter, please hit me up with a uh, Photoshop of Ime Udoka as Carrie Underwood in the Jesus Take the Wheel video. <laughs> That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.